OK, thanks. And so I, I sent this abstract last night. I mean, I was actually, and then people told me, I said, the abstract says, well, it's like exponential. And these people, isn't this quadratic? Uh, and it really, well, OK, so I have to explain what I mean. Uh, so there is a, sorry, this is, yeah. I have to press. I have to start on this one? Yeah. OK. I see. Oh, I, get, oh, I understand now. Yeah. Uh, so you know, whenever you have like a surf or any hyperbolic manifold, there is a negative record manifold. There is a unique a geodesic in every homotopy class, right? So now suppose that instead of a negative record manifold, you just take the usual setup where you have a translation surface. So this, the metric is flat, but it still has negative curvature with singularities. And it turns out that you know, most homotopy classes, namely the ones which don't correspond to a cylinder, have a unique closed geodesic in them. And this is typically just like a union of saddle connections, which changes direction, right? Somehow, all, I mean, I didn't really draw correctly, but all the angles are, are bigger than pi. And so I want to count, uh, count how many of those there are. So maybe n of r is the number of closed geodesics on. And now the surface is always going to be fixed. <laughs> Unlike essentially every, every other work I did on this subject, we are, moduli space plays absolutely no role. This is just a single translation surface, single metric. And so, and so the theorem, this is joined with uh, Pastor Rafi, is that this is, uh, behaves like you would expect. where h is something which depends on the surface, and you, it's, it's some sort of an entropy. So this is like the Margulis kind of asymptotic formula for this kind of stuff. No, this, this thing does not have a constant. Unlike the, unlike the lattice point counting, which has a constant, this one does not. Like, it, like, no, no, it's fine. It's Margulis is always this. If you look at Margulis' thesis, this is always the, the, the asymptotics. Change the entropy. Yeah, if you, you can actually, actually, we are going to, actually, this, this thing scales with the surface. And I mean, maybe, thank you for asking, we just will we'll actually, in our proof, we'll usually dilate the surface uh, so that the entropy is equal to 1. This will make some, some proofs easier. OK, so now is there is also related work which uh, uh, by uh, Jede Vasreya, uh, Steve Lally, and Jenny Sapir. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about it. But uh, first, let me see. How do, how do you actually think about this kind of a problem? Uh, so, you know, if you want to have this kind of an asymptotics, then you want you better have a dynamical system. At least, usually, you, you need a dynamical system. So, what's a dynamical system? So, let me start from a completely different place. Suppose that you start with a graph G, and uh, so it's going to be an oriented graph. So maybe I'm going to have a whole bunch of vertices. And uh, I have some edges. Some edges are connected by a vertex, some are not. It just goes back. And what we are going to do is we are going to consider like infinite paths in this graph. So basically infinite collection of vertices. And there is some sort of a notion of an admissible path, namely that you, know, you can have uh, a v2 can follow v1 if and only if there is an arrow going from v1 to v2. So there is a notion of an admissible path. 
And so this is called this setup is called a topological. This is called a topological Markov chain. And a typological Markov shift, sorry. Well, I'll, I'll say what the shift is in a moment. Uh, yeah, by the way, yeah, so what is a shift map? So maybe I'll have a space. It's going to be a collection of vertices. It's an infinite, infinite pass, and somehow uh, vi plus 1 has to be connected to vi. And then I have a map, which is a shift, which says somehow the rule is that the i entry of TV is v i plus 1. So I, I basically remove the first letter and think of it moving to the left. Probably I should start at, at 0. OK, so, of course, so what is? Uh, relation between this and, and what we have, well, uh, vertices are going to be the same thing as saddle connections. And, you know, a vertex, let's say vi, is connected to vi plus 1. So what's what's v so v v i is uh, uh, Alex, yeah. Can you just say what it means? It means the ratio goes to one. I guess. Uh, it means that the ratio goes to one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean there are, there are various levels of uh, precision you want to have. Like you can talk about just take the log and see what what that goes to. That's much easier. And here you want to kind of get a slightly more precise information. You can also, of course, talk about error terms, but I'm not doing that. But in, so really, what's a vertex? A vertex is a saddle connection. So this is v1, which is really a saddle connection. And I have another vertex, which is another saddle connection. So this is. And maybe I a little bit confusing here, because I'm drawing the saddle connections as arrows. But on the level of a graph, there are points. So I have somehow there is this v1. Is a, so these are like, so now what do, I want to say, what does it mean that v1 is connected to v2? Well, it just means that you can have, so if and only if, well, first I need two conditions. To be able to make this as a part of a closed periodic trajectory, I need to have that the head of v2 has to be the tail of v1. And also, you know, that the angle, this angle, well, uh, it has a role, it's better be bigger than, or at least bigger equal to pi, right? If it's less than pi, you would never take this path. You will just go take a shortcut as a lens minimizing path in homotopy class, right? So is this clear what, 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 what is the graph I'm talking about? So my graph is actually fairly close to the complete graph. I basically have all the saddle connections. These are the vertices. And most of them are, you know, the condition that the, one of them is connected to the other is this one, right? So are you thinking saddle connections are oriented? Saddle connections are oriented, yes. Thank you. And so uh, closed, so sort of periodic pass. Uh, on, on the graph uh, are the same thing as closed geodesics in the flat matrix. And by the way, what is a periodic path? And so a periodic path is the same thing, which is it's really points x such that tn of x equals to x for some n. Right, because given a path, I can kind of duplicate it as an infinite word by just repeating it over and over again. And then I get a periodic point for this, for this thing. So, so this is good because I've kind of, this is now talking about fixed points of a dynamical system, periodic points for a dynamical system. 
except that, of course, I, I'm, I'm, I'm losing information here, right? So what am I losing? What did I do wrong? The length. I'm not keeping track of the length, right? Because I'm just, I'm, my n is really the number of cell connections in this periodic path and not the length of the periodic path. So that, there is a very standard construction to do this. You basically look at this. So the idea is you look at the suspension. Uh, you call it suspension flow. But really, what is it? It's in general, if, whenever you have like a dynamical systems, you can. So this is my space x. Let's say, or maybe let's call it omega. And I have a map t going from omega to omega, which is what we have. And I can make it into a flow. It's going to be. Uh, so I'm going to call this. Uh, I'm going to pick something. This, the, there is some function. Uh, there is going to be a function l going from omega to r, which is a positive function. It's called a roof function. And what is my flow going to be? My flow, I'm going to create a flow. And the flow is going to be like this. It's, go, it's called flow under the roof function. So I'm going to, if I start at the point here, you just go constant speed until you reach the top. And then at that point, you, up, you, you connect this point to, so this is the point x, you connect, uh, the, you start, you apply t and get to a point, go to a point here. And then you're going to continue. And then maybe at this point, you apply t again, and you're going to get some other point, OK? So I have this suspension flow. So, so maybe, uh, I, let me write down. It, L is not a function. It's, a, it's really a function from my space. And so my total space is going to be om, uh, omega cross, uh, so it's going to be pairs. And, or actually, I'll, I'll call these things axes. And the height is between. So y is, the, is this region, is this thing. And then there is a natural flow on, on y. Uh, and so here, and, you know, on y, what you have to do, what you are doing is this is kind of modern identification. And the identification here is that x, uh, L of x is uh, identified with tx0, right? So this point is glued to this point. Is this, is this clear what I'm doing? Yeah. My question is, why is it true that every part of the graph corresponds to one zero digit in the fact that it's those zero digits? You can always translate it so that it's part of the cell connection. Well, the problem is that if, you're, if it starts turning, there is only, if, it, if, if the path is, if the path corresponds to a cylinder, then it's, you're right, there is not a unique path. But, but most, of the, uh, most of the time, this uh, path is, not go, is going to be a union of different cell connections in different directions, which are like kind of turning, around, you know, turning at angles bigger than 2 pi. Because I'm looking at homotopy class on the entire surface, which is, may, might not, but, and then there is only one. Is it, yes, the number of cylinders is negligible because this is yeah, grows yeah. exponentially, and uh, you only two yeah, but no, but in, in, in principle, everything in between is also representative. So, right. in the point of cell connections. Yeah. Okay, that's true. But there is no unique path for a cylinder, so that's all. I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, no, sorry. No, no, no. You the 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 cell connections are are, are themselves the vertices, yes, and uh, and you can uh, and so T is really acts on infinite sequences of cell connections. This space is really, inf all of these vertices are, are actually, I should be calling them Vs, they are really gammas. So 
So this omega is really a kind of infinite sequence of cell connections, which are all kind of, the sequence kind of is admissible in the sense that the successive cell connections could uh, satisfy these conditions. And, and so this encodes this, uh, this kind of information. So it, it's a much more stupid thing than what you, what you think it is. OK? So, so this is really, so, so, so OK. So this means that we are, so now since we have done, oh, yes, of course, when we are going to do this, we are going to make this flow, which is basically kind of the, you know, this is going to be just, and then, of course, you keep track of the identifications. And so now we are basically, we are now in a situation where we have, uh, uh, we are really kind of, uh, so uh, now is, you know, this, this is the number of closed trajectories. Uh, of this flow of length at most r. So, we, so there is a dynamical reformulation of the problem, of the geometric problem. Okay. Uh, so, is everything okay so far? All right, so now uh, what are we going to do? So this is okay. So this is a symbolic dynamical system. This is called a, a topological Markov shift with the potential. For, I mean, yes, so this, this flow under the suspended flow over, over a Markov shift. Um, now, there is a well developed theory of this. And so it really, what this theorem is really basically the same thing as number of periodic trajectories of this flow. So there is some, uh, so, so somehow, you know, you, uh, there is some sort of a, if when you do this kind of dynamics, you know there are certain things which you have to watch out for. So this is kind of a well-developed theory. But uh, there is, a, especially by Omri Sarig, and but one of the things you need to worry about is whether this flow that I've defined here is mixing. This is, this, if it's not mixing, there is a serious problem. And so, I, and. And of course, there is somehow there are really two different aspects. One is dynamics on the base, which is basically going to be always very nice because it's somehow these kind of symbolic things are usually very mixing. But the, the fact that there is a roof function is, is bad news because imagine there was a following situation. Imagine the roof function is actually constant. So, sorry, just a quick question. So T is a semi-flow. T is a semi-flow, yeah, but, but you can make it into a flow as well. You can make it to the usual trick. But I'm, I'm going to work about, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm only going to think about positive T. But here, here is sort of a here is a problem. Imagine that my roof function is constant. And now imagine that I look at a set which looks like this. <coughs> right? So if I so I, if I start with this set and I start moving it by the flow, it's always going to be like look like this, right? So it's going to just start moving around. That violates mixing. It's not going to be spread all over, right? It's going to stay like a horizontal line forever. So, so the, in this case, if the roof function is constant, this thing is not mixing. Well, OK, imagine that all, there is sort of a similar problem if you imagine that the roof function is kind of has uh, two, uh, kind of imagine that it's like one half the time and two the other half of the time. Then you're going to see that it's going to be a similar issue. It's not going to be not mixing. And so, Turns out that this is somehow, for this kind of stuff, this is the only problem. And uh, there is sort of a theorem. So really, it's not mixing. If and only if takes values in somehow al uh, alpha times the natural numbers, where alpha is some positive number. So, uh, so sort of roof function. So this is a zero. Is 
No, no. This is a theorem of Omri Sarg, I think, in, the, in this particular setting. But it's, I'm not totally sure. Uh, and also, I have to tell you what is not mixing, which measure. And it's actually the measure of maximal entropy, but I'm suppressing this for a moment. Um, yeah. Could you repeat which measure is not mixing? The measure of maximal entropy, which I haven't defined yet. But it's actually clear that kind of essentially nothing is going to be mixing if, the, if this condition is violated. Um, but now, uh, there is sort of a little exercise. Uh, and this is something which kind of threw me into panic for about one minute. And then, of course, I realized it's not a problem. Uh, how, what do we know about translation surfaces? Our roof function just lends of saddle connections, right? So how do we know that all, not all, there is no translation surface where all the saddle connections are multiples of you know, 0.37? Integer multiples of 0.37. Well, what if it's square tile? Then you know. Well, of, yeah, no, no. But this is this is nonsense because just look at the cylinder. Whenever you have a cylinder, you have this guy, but then you also have. You can have twists, right? And if if you if you start doing twists around the cylinder, you get square roots. And square roots are inconsistent with such a thing. So our flow is mixing. That's that's not a problem. I mean, do you also want? I mean, the roof function is also not vanishing. Yeah, roof function should not be vanishing. Otherwise, we're going to be in deep trouble. But I'm going okay. to. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It actually, it, it actually. I mean, it's actually important for this part. Part of this. Yeah. Uh, uh, part of this. Uh, by the way. Most of the stuff that I'm going to quote here, a lot of the stuff is actually, the theory here is developed by Omri Sarig. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to actually skip the proof of this. But there is an, uh, so the problem with this, uh, now, this kind of theorem, so the problem is our topological Markov shift that has infinitely many states, there are infinitely many saddle connections. If there are finitely many states, then for any flow, flow under a Markov shift, this was proved. By, by Perry in the 60s, and there's also a book by Perry and Polycott. Uh, but this is for shifts of finite type, SFT. Shift, so that uh, shift of finite type is like a topological mark of shift that are finitely many states. So this is some well known theory. And uh, Omri Sarig had, and may actually several other people, but his is the most, <coughs> I think, the best treatment. Kind of uh, had some, you know, various ways of generalizing this to infinite, infinite many states, and that it's, it's of course, it's not true without any conditions. But there is sort of a very, very nice condition which is t sufficient for like a lot of good things to happen, and it turns out that it's actually also necessary for some good things to happen, and it's called the BIP, big image and pre-image condition, and I'll tell you what what the condition is. There exists a finite uh, set k of states of vertices uh, such that every vertex is connected uh, to a vertex in k and uh, every vertex and some vertex, uh, you know, kind of. How about I just say it in, like in both directions? Uh, and and uh, sorry, such that for every vertex v, uh, v is connected to vertex in K, and. Uh, some vertex in K <laughs> is connected to V. So you basically have like a, like a condition where there is a finite number of states, and you can get to everywhere else in one step from these states. And this is called BIP. And there is sort of a folklore theorems. Uh, BIP is kind of behaves like uh, 
a like ships of finite type. And this is sort of a, it's not quite a theorem, but Omri Sarig has a lot of results saying that this, this, this uh, of this type, that BIP, B, B, shift with this condition, yes. Connected by one edge? One edge, single edge. So here it's so definitely. You have 20, 20 singularities. K, K is a finite step, so I'm, I'm going to pick some. I'm going to pick some large number of collections, like reasonably short cycle connections, which kind of visit all the all the vertices. And so, so this is uh, so really what happened was that the way I thought about this problem is okay, fine. So it's just it's an exercise. I'm going to take the Perry and Polycott proof, and I'm going to make it work. Uh, you know, under this condition for this BIP because it should work exactly like set of finite type and. And you know, so I, I thought it was like kind of like doing an IKEA kind of thing where you get instructions. <laughs> and I got instructions. I got I emailed Omri Sarig, who actually emailed me exactly the instructions of how I'm supposed to do it. <laughs> and like you know, which papers do I put together to make this work? And I unlike you, the IKEA where you actually don't understand the instructions, you're basically on your own. I could actually I, at some point I didn't understand the instructions, so I asked him a question and he answered. So it was like even better than IKEA that I can actually get like technical support. Uh, uh, but turns out that there was actually a, 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 a bit of a glitch, and some of, not all of the pieces really fit together the way they were supposed to. And at some point, I had to do some hammering. Uh, but uh, I think I'm probably not going to get to that point, so I'm kind of going too slow. Uh, but uh, so I'm actually I'm done at 11:30, right? 11.45, OK. Um, but so let me see how far I can get. I'll probably not get to the, to the point where I had to use a hammer. But uh, so, so, what, so, what's, so what's, what happened? So first, I want to explain how Paris paper works. It's kind of cool because you know, a little bit of number theory. So Paris wants to use zeta functions. So, what's a Riemann, so let's, let's talk about the Riemann zeta function. So zeta of s is, as you all know, right? this is the Riemann zeta function, which is also happens to be the product of all the primes. And so, it has all kinds of wonderful properties. It has metamorphic continuation to all of the complex plane. This converges for real part of S at least one. It has metamorphic continuation as a pole at S equals to one. And you can prove it. Uh, you can use it to prove all kinds of things. You're going to, in particular, the prime number theorem, which I'll show you how to prove. The prime number theorem, by the way, says the number of primes less than x is equal to x over log x. Uh, OK, so, you, so what does have to do with dynamics? Well, you can define something called the Royal zeta function. The Royal zeta function is the idea is that we are going to have this weird idea. Is that, uh, so we are going to, what are, uh, in terms of primes, are, uh, are going to be, well, I'm going to say that they are lengths of periodic trajectories but uh, to make this thing work a little bit better I'm going to talk about I'm going to define them to be exponentials of so uh, so a prime is like e to the length of a periodic trajectory these are the analog of the primes so if you follow this then you can define the royal zeta function. I'm going to call zeta sub r. r stands for royal, not Riemann. So this is going to be the product over all periodic trajectories gamma of 1 minus e to the minus s times the length of gamma inverse. So 
this tries to mimic this. And again, this is a product of all periodic trajectories, OK? Huh? Uh, OK. I'm counting a periodic trajectory only once. So if you, if you do it twice, that doesn't count. So OK, so this converges if. No, Ro Roel. Okay. So this converges if the real part of S is bigger than H, where H is the topological entropy of the flow. And we are always going to normalize. Uh, and so it has a pole at S equals to H. And we are going to normalize so that the entropy is equal to 1. So we are going to just take, take our surface and rescale it so the entropy is 1 to make the analogy with the Riemann zeta function better. Yeah. L is the length of the trajectory, which is related to the length of the trajectory. Yeah? Uh, and so there is sort of an identity which expresses this. I'll, let me skip that identity for now. <laughs> so here is a, so the heart of the proof consists of the following theorem. So this is a, in order to prove this, uh, Analog of that thing, then here is what you need to prove. Oh, yeah, so sorry. I want to uh, I want to make another definition. So A is going to be a vertex. Okay, so this is, means this is the same thing as a saddle connection. So zeta A of S is the same thing, is the same thing, as, is, is the same thing. But uh, product over gamma of the same thing. But the condition is that gamma must uh, contain A. So we are looking at periodic uh, trajectories which kind of pass through a given vertex, which means that they contain a given saddle connection as a set. And it turns out, uh, and if, even I'm not going to talk about this is the kind of technical kind of thing. Turns out that it's enough to actually consider this. Basically, it's enough to count the things which contain a given segment because things which don't contain some given cell connection should be exponentially smaller. And this requires some justification, but it can be done. Somehow, you would think a very long cell connection should just check all the possible, use all everything possible. You know, at least want to use everything possible. And if you impose a condition that you don't use something, that should be exponentially smaller. And so we are going to technically. So I'm going to put in zeta a. Zeta is like the real zeta function, but I'm only insisting that I'm using that you use some more uh, fixed saddle connection. And so here is, a, here is the theorem that, sorry, so how do I go like this? Yeah, sorry, I haven't been, oh, I see. Thank you. So the theorem is that Uh, the zeta a, so there exists sort of a, for all a, uh, there exists some sort of a theta, or actually called sigma, bigger than zero such that zeta a has a meromorphic continuation. Uh, to real a bigger than or equal to sigma, real s uh, bigger equal to, uh, to sigma, sorry, uh, to 1 minus sigma. Uh, it has So it has the following property. So it has zeta is a matter of continuation. It has a pole. at s equals to 1. And the third property is it has no other singularity. It has no uh, other 
at false or zeros. Uh, on the real line S. So somehow the picture here is that I have the, this is one. So this thing has a metamorphic continuation to some region over like this. So it's, this function makes sense on some Slightly bigger thing. The, the product only converges on here, so it has need to continue it. It has a pole on this point, and it has no zeros or poles on this line. Now it's kind of obvious from the definition it has no zeros or poles in this region where everything converges. But the, the statement is that it also has no zeros or poles on this line, other than the pole that s equals to one. So this is really the heart of the problem is to prove the theorem. But now I'm going to want to tell, show you how to use this theorem to, pr to produce asymptotics. It's strictly speaking our theorem, but it's really basically like this kind of IKEA assembly kind of thing. Uh, there is some uh, IKEA assembly with a glitch, OK? So there is maybe strictly speaking it's kind of our theorem, but it's most of it is. But this is sort of polycott Yeah, Perry and polycott don't, no, it's not the Perry. Perry and polycott basically tells you how to use such a theorem to prove is the correct thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the theorem itself is mostly due to Sarig and then also Savchenko. Yeah. So I, I would say that this is a combination of uh, Sarig, Savchenko. There is some stuff by Kurevich and Savchenko. And then there is a plus epsilon, and the epsilon is due to us. Uh, and uh, OK, so how, but how do you prove this? Well, I've, I want to first, uh, I want to tell you how do you do it for the prime number theorem. So first, uh, is there is something called the ikihara Tauberian theorem. It's a general theorem about Fourier series, Dirichlet series. Suppose uh, summation n equals, let's say, A n over n to the s has uh, maybe properties 1, 2, and 3. Then Okay, so here I've, I've slightly cheated. It's asymptotic to n. Uh, by the way, I should have added here n has residue 1. Uh, because otherwise you could just normalize it. So then, so this, so this is uh, this, this here. It's uh, kind of a classical theorem from the 30s. Uh, by the way, the fact that the Riemann zeta function has these properties is not at all obvious. And it was something which was took 50 years after Riemann. Riemann himself proved the first property, uh, the second property, uh, but the third property is hard for the Riemann zeta function. And this was, this was uh, basically the proof of the prime number theorem. In the, this was a crowning achievement of 19th century mathematics, done in 1899. <laughs> but the Talbiran theorem actually is much later. It's from the 30s. It was a, 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 essentially an attempt to understand the proof of the prime number theorem. OK, so let me just, up, so if you apply the theorem, if I apply uh, to a zeta function, so then the an is equal to 1. And you get summation k equals 1 to n of 1 is asymptotic to n, which is a complicated proof of 
a very stupid fact, right? Uh, but if I but then there is an identity. If I look at zeta prime of s divided by zeta of s, if you work out what it is, it's really not hard because you take the log of this product with the primes and then manipulate a little bit. So this is going to be the sum over n of what's called the Mangold, Mang Mangold function, where lambda of n is going to be is going to be log p if n equals to p to some power and 0 otherwise. And so applying, so if you apply the Tauberian theorem to this function and use the fact that zeta has no poles or zeros on this line. Actually, I slightly messed up. Uh, for, for, for this, I don't care about zeros on this line. I just have to argue that it has no poles on this line. But anyway, I hope you understand what I mean. If you apply this to this function, you get that, you get that summation lambda n is asymptotic to n. And this is basically log p. And then if you manipulate it, so this is a, a, a summation uh, p uh, over p less than n of log p is asymptotic to n, and this is the same thing as the prime number theorem. Okay. This is it's, it's just very straightforward. And this identity is very easy to prove. And you kind of have some rough idea how primes grow, so this is easy. Converting from here to here is easy. Uh, but so now, if I want to apply the same, so I can basically do the same kind of thing. Uh, so apply a Tauberian theorem uh, to, you know, this kind of thing. But this is a royal zeta function. And uh, this is also, yeah, there is some int problem interpretation. You, I want to say that this is a sum over something of uh, lambda of that something divided by that something to the s. So I'll write it like this. But of course, uh, I'm going to write it like this, e to the l gamma prime to the s. But what is what is this? The problem this is that here you have integers, and in the royal kind of zeta function language, we don't really have integers; we just have primes. Yeah. Shouldn't there be a minus sign in front of the logarithmic derivative? If you do it correctly, I think that, I think there is no minus sign in what I said. Maybe there is. I don't think so. I, you have to check. You have to compute this. Maybe there is a minus sign. Maybe you're right. I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. But in any case. Uh, Actually, I think no, because, well, it's the number of primes is positive, not negative. I'm sure about that part. And when you write the sum of log p, you have to count also the numbers that are in the case with p. Yeah, and they don't contribute. It's really easy to get rid of them, because there are some are rare enough that you don't. <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you do this, and well, you have to understand what what's what's uh, what's analog of the integers. If the, the periodic trajectories have to do with primes. Well, you introduce something called this is just for calculation. This, this is what Perry called fictitious trajectories. Fictitious trajectories. So lambda gamma prime is going to be fictitious trajectory. Which is just basically going to be for formal union union of periodic trajectories. And you allow multiplicities. But then if you make this definition, then all of the stuff makes sense. And you can get the Bangmol function, get the same proof works, and you get, you get the correct thing. 
Okay, so I don't want to do the details here because I'm really running late. So, I so what instead I want to give you is you have some idea of how do you prove this theorem, okay? Okay, so there is this. Uh, so, in order to talk about it, I first have to do, say a few real quick works about thermodynamic formalisms. By the way, in, for all of this stuff, there is this really great book by Sarik, which is called The Thermodynamic Formalism for Topological Markov Shifts. I highly recommend it. It's very clear and it explains a lot of stuff, which I'm skipping here. Uh, the name of the book is called Thermodynamic Formalism. Uh, for, I'm going to write TMS, but it's topological Markov shift. And this is by Sari. It's on his web page. You can find it there. So, okay. So, the, I have to talk a little bit about entropy. So, I, so actually, I have this roof function up there. And so, I, I have the flow. So, I'm, how is the entropy of the flow? Uh, yeah, actually, before I talk about entropy, I have the flow up there. So, if I have an invariant measure for the flow, if uh, so mu is invariant measure for the flow, well, what, what can it look like? And then I have to, well, it has to be basically Lebesgue on the fiber. So it has to be some measure on the base times just Lebesgue measure on the fiber. So it's just because it's invariant by the flow. Uh, and now, so I ha now have a measure. Uh, so the entropy. So now I can compare entropies. So this is a called Abramov's formula. And Abramov's formula relates the entropy of this measure with respect to the flow. And here, I, by the entropy with respect to the flow, I'm really looking at the time one map of the flow. So maybe I should even write t sub 1. But I'm just going to write it like this. But I'm really, by this, I mean the entropy of flow. I just mean the entropy of the time one map. And so this is related to the entropy of the map of the shift on the base. And then just in terms of the, uh, divided by the, turns out it's just uh, integral, sorry. The integral over the base of the roof functions. So, so, so the entropy of the flow is basically the same as the entropy of the base, but you have to normalize it by the integral of the roof function. Okay. So this is a very important formula, and now I want to imagine that I look at the measure of maximal entropy. So suppose that okay. So suppose that I want to look at the measure of maximal entropy. So I want to look at this and make this be uh, some sort of number which we'll call little h. So there are three h's there hanging around the camp. So this h is just a measure of the maximal entropy. This is a measure of this. And h nu and h mu and h are different things, OK? So if I have this formula, then another way of rearranging this is I can think about a H nu of H. So I'm, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to get rid of this. So I'm going to look at this over this is equal to H. So H nu of t uh, minus little h times uh, integral of omega over omega of uh, L. d nu is equal to 0, right? This is, this is a correct statement, right? And another way of thinking about this is the pressure uh, of, so I'm going to define what pressure is. And 
okay, well, it's, it's going to be the soup over, you yeah? Here, I'm slightly cheating, but I hope you'll forgive me. So, so whenever, so this phi is called the potential. So here I, I want to think about phi as being minus HL, where H is actually the topological entropy. And really, this equation can be written as a, as is the integral. So instead of if I put in phi, so this is the same thing as uh, if this phi is minus HL, then this whole thing is equal to zero, right? So really, the upshot of this is, so the idea is instead of working on the floor, I just want to work on the base. So if I want to work on the base, and I introduce this potential, which is going to be minus the topological entropy times, times the root function. I'm go and then instead of looking for uh, measures of maximum entropy on the base, which doesn't know about the root function, I, should, I just try to maximize this pressure. I look at the e equilibrium states, which are measures where the, with this expression called the pressure is maximum. OK? So this is a way of thinking of just working on the base. So really the upside is I should use, think about the potential, which is this. And then I'm going to try to maximize this quantity. But also, uh, the other thing which is going to be important for us is that the pressure, which is the maximum itself, of this is actually equal to 0. right? So this is a, because of the way that we found the topological entropy is characterized by this. So the pressure of phi. So this is the same thing as the pressure of phi. So our potential is actually has zero pressure. OK, so now we can, so this is, allows us to work basically on the base. So the dynamic formula is basically the study of things, such things with the potential. And so here the potential really comes from the Abramo formula. OK, so I have five minutes. Uh, so let me say a few really quick words about this. Uh, so now, in, in general, if you have a Markov chain, so Markov chain is basically you have this graph like what, what I had up there. But imagine that you kind of have probabilities going, you know, so if for every vertex, you kind of have probabilities going to the next vertex according to one. You just pick one of the edges at random with some probability, right? And then you kind of w run around with the graph. So, so like P, P i j is the probability of going from i to j. And uh, P, uh, like I said, uh, P A B N is uh, uh, actually I'll just write this P A A N. This is the same thing as a probability of uh, starting at a, uh, of ending at A after n steps. Uh, provided you start, start starting at A. OK, so this is the probability that you're going to start at A, and after n steps, you're going to end up back at A. And there is also, I want to have another one, which I'll go like this. This is the same thing, uh, but you know, probability. That uh, is the first return time to the state A is n. So I start at A, and I kind of walk around, and I'm trying to compute the probability that after n steps, I come back at A, and in between, I haven't visited A again. This, this is called a taboo probability. I'm not allowed to visit A in the middle. OK? So this. Can you read the handwriting at the bottom of this? The return time to A is n. This is, a, this is just really the first return probability. Uh, so a Markov chain, uh, so definition.
Markov chain is is our symbol is transient So transit, if there is a probability, you start at some vertex A, never return. And it's uh, positive recurrent. If not transient, and now the expectation is so someone look look at the expectation of the first return time. So uh, it turns out to be the same. I'm gonna just write it like this, okay? It turns out to be equivalent. Okay, I'll get back to it. I'm kind of really out of time, so I'm gonna just take note this afterwards. And so, so, and so I want to think about the expectation of the first return time is finite. So you return, and, but you, you're finite and null recurrent. If, uh, again, not transient. And this probability is uh, infinite. Sorry, is there an eraser or anything like this? Oh, no. Okay, so now there is a sort of another little aspect. I'm going to be like maybe two minutes over. There is sort of a subset which we have to do, which is this is a serious subset of B. So this is this is called a, a, a strong positive recurrent. Uh, this means that it's positive recurrent, and uh, you know there is somehow kind of has an exponential moment. So I have a look at for some epsilon. So somehow these things add up to. They kind of you really really want to come back. So now, when we when you talk about this R situation, you don't quite have a Markov chain, but instead of uh, somehow the idea is that instead of the probabilities, you have this potential, and so somehow you know you have instead of this uh, P A A N, uh, well I'm gonna this corresponds to e to the uh, phi n of a, where phi n of a is, uh, you know, like phi of a plus phi of t a plus phi of t n minus one a, phi of t to the n minus one a. So this is kind of a definite. So you kind of think of this as a probability. So you somehow use this phi to the probability. The probabilities no longer add up to one, but that's okay. You still think of this this way, and then the this P A A A. This is again. This is just somehow. It's 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 going to be again the. It's the same kind of sum, but here you talk about the first return time. Uh, so it's going to be the sum over all trajectories. 
uh, well, anyway, so I'm sorry, I'm kind of really out of time. But uh, the idea is that you can define the, the three notions. Uh, you can define the analogs of these things. I'm just going to say in words what I was going to say in, in letters. So you can define the analog of the, all of those things in terms of this Markov chain. And the key point is that this BIP condition implies strong positive recurrence for this Markov chain. And this strong positive recurrence, if you think about this, it kind of means that there's some generating function, which is going to end up being related to the zeta function, is convergent on a bigger region than you normally expect. And this is what leads to the theorem. This basically is the outline of how the rest of the proof goes. It doesn't quite work, but uh, that's how it's supposed to go. Anyway, thank you for your time.